AQA, A-level physics, thermal physics, and this is the fourth video, and it's kinetic theory part two. I'm doing three videos on kinetic theory. This is the second one, and this is what I'm going to be looking at. This is the mathematical one, okay? Basically, what we're going to do in this video is we're going to derive this equation here. Now, uh, you definitely need to understand all the different bits in this equation, and you may be asked to actually derive bits of it. I don't think from the beginning you're going to be actually derived from first principles, the whole thing, because it would take too long. But there's certainly bits and pieces of it that you will need to be able to understand where it came from. So be familiar with it. Be familiar with the derivation. So let's dive in. There's quite a few different stages to this. So this is our ideal gas. This is kinetic theory. It's a model of an ideal gas, lots of balls bouncing around in a box. Uh, and we're going to have to make some assumptions. OK, and you should learn these assumptions. I've seen questions where it says state two of the assumptions made in kinetic theory. So learn these assumptions there are four of them uh, there's a very large number moving randomly well obviously very large number we're talking you know in a mole six times 10 to the 23 very large number moving randomly okay so in all directions moving around yes they are elastic spheres so elastic as in when they collide the, there's no kinetic energy lost yes so uh, they are elastic spheres uh, the forces between the particles are negligible in this derivation we're going to ignore any interaction between the particles there will be interaction the particles are banging into each other um, not on this syllabus though that's something else mean free path and all that we do in OCR not in AQA but we're going to ignore any attraction or whatever between the particles uh, and the time for the collisions is much smaller than the time between the collisions I would learn very large number moving randomly elastic spheres learn that so first of all RMS CRMS what's that then well Look at this diagram. Um, imagine we've got 20 particles now moving randomly. So 10 of them are going from left to right and 10 of them are going from right to left. So 10 of them have got a positive velocity and 10 of them have got a negative velocity. Yeah, large number moving randomly. So what's the average velocity of those particles? And second question, what's the average speed of those particles? Now, if you can be bothered to work it out, pause the video and do it. I'll tell you the answer. The average velocity is zero. Yeah, the average velocity of all the air molecules that in the room that you are in now is zero. Now, why? Because there's a large number moving randomly. There's as many going from left to right as there are from right to left. There's as many going up as there are down. The average velocity, velocity is a vector. The average velocity is zero. The average speed in this case is 350 meters per second, which is probably about the average speed of the air molecules in the room that you're in, actually, about 350 meters per second. That's the average speed. Now, we don't use either of them. What we use is this. All of these velocities, square them. That will get rid of the negative. Take the average of all the squares and then square root it. And that will give you something called the RMS velocity. The RMS velocity is the root of the mean of all of the velocities squared. Yeah, the root of the mean of the squares, the RMS. When we did alternating current, yeah, in year, well, I don't know where you are in year two, but alternating current, there's the RMS voltage, the RMS current. This is the RMS velocity and it's CRMS. Now, for the moment, 
it's about equal to the average speed. That will do for the moment. And if you calculate it, in this case, you get about 400 meters per second for the RMS velocity. Now, as I said, all of the particles, they don't have the same speed. There's a distribution. It's called a Boltzmann distribution, okay? And basically, some of them aren't moving very fast at all. Some of them are moving quite fast. Some of them are moving very, very fast. What actually happens is that, you know, as time goes on, because they're colliding with each other and they are exchanging kinetic energy with each other, yes, then, uh, you know, a particle may be moving slowly now, but then it may be moving very, very fast, and then it may be moving very, very slow, a ridiculous number of collisions per second. But at any point in time, at any point in time, this is the distribution of the velocities of the particles in the gas. Now, very large number, the average velocity will be zero. The RMS velocity is a little bit past the hump on this curve. The average kinetic energy of the particles is actually a half m times CRMS squared. Remember, kinetic energy is a half mv squared. Well, a half mv squared, the average kinetic energy is a half m times the RMS velocity squared. Okay, that's really why the RMS velocity is important. The average kinetic energy of the particles is a half m CRMS squared. We're going to use this little equation later. Make a note of it. We'll come back to it. Okay, let's go on a different track now. Imagine this, a particle of mass m moving towards a rigid wall at a velocity u, and it bounces off the wall, and it comes back with a velocity minus u. Remember, it's an elastic collision, okay? So it doesn't lose any kinetic energy in this collision if it's a rigid wall. What is its momentum before it hits the wall? What is its momentum after the collision? What is the change in momentum? And the answers are... There you go. So mu after the collision minus mu, the change in momentum is 2mu. Yeah, that's the change in momentum in this collision. Now, this particle, imagine it's in a box, it's in a cube, and the, the sides of the cube are L. OK, so the volume of the cube is L cubed. The area of one of the walls is L squared. OK, how long will it take before the particle collides with that face again? Well, to collide with that face again, it's got to go from there all the way to there and then bounce back again. So it's got to travel a distance of 2L. OK, and then what will the average force on the wall be? So, first of all, velocity is distance over time. So the time between collisions with that face is 2L over U. The average force on the wall will be the change in momentum divided by the time between collisions. Uh, so the force due to one particle on one wall hitting it at a right angle is m u squared over l, where u is the velocity perpendicular to the wall. The force due to one particle, look at this graph, due to one particle, the force will be like bang, 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 due to one particle, won't it? The average force of all of them is what we're talking about now, looking at the graph, F average, and that's F equals M U squared over L. Now, there is more than one particle. The average force due to one particle is M U squared over L. The average force due to N particles is N times M U squared bar over L where u squared bar is the average value of u squared. Yeah, they have lots of all these particles. There's lots of them. They've got different velocities. The average value of u squared bar. And then the pressure is force over area. The area of that wall is L squared. So we end up with nm u squared bar divided by L cubed. 
And remember, L cubed is the volume. So equals Nm u squared bar over V. We're getting close, aren't we? Okay, remember that little equation. We're going to come back to that in a bit. So where does the one third come from? Well, uh, three dimensions, x, y, z. Consider a particle with velocity c1. So look on the diagram, there's c1. And let's say it's got components u, v, and w. Uh, the u component is in the x direction. Yeah, and then v is in the y, and w is in the z. Not bothered about them at the moment, but component u in the x direction. Now, from Pythagoras, obviously Pythagoras in three dimensions, uh, c1 squared is u1 squared plus v1 squared plus w1 squared, which is Pythagoras. Now, if we have a very, very large number of particles moving randomly, then the average value of u squared is going to be the same as the average value of v squared, and that's going to be the same as the average value of w squared. Therefore, u squared bar is a third c squared bar. Yeah, and that's where the, the third comes in. What we're actually doing is we're going from one dimension, which is this, the x dimension, which was u, to a, a three dimensional thing, which is c. Yes, so u squared bar is a third c squared bar. So here are my two equations. I've got p is nm u squared bar over v. And I've got u squared bar is a third c squared bar. So if we combine them, we get that. Yay, we got there. P v is a third nm c squared bar. And we understand what all these bits and pieces are now, don't we? And we know where it comes from. Okay, now remember that the square root of c squared bar is crms. Yeah, the RMS velocity. So instead of writing just C squared bar, we can write C RMS squared. Uh, in the specification, it actually puts it in brackets. Okay, and that's where this equation came from. Will you need to be able to derive the whole thing? No, but certainly be able to follow my derivation.